Hello, and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Stopping Violence Before It Occurs, Violence Prevention, Maternal and Child Health, and Public Health. Our objectives today are to describe the public health approach to addressing youth violence and its value as a framework for violence prevention, to demonstrate the connection between violence prevention, public health, and maternal and child health, and to identify keys to success from New Orleans early efforts to prevent youth violence. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email our faculty presenter during our live broadcast. The phone number and email address are on your screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. The Alabama Department of Public Health is an approved provider of continuing nursing education by the Alabama State Nurses Association. The association is an accredited approver of continuing nursing education by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in and evaluation. Instructions on how to do this can be found at the bottom of the sign-in sheet. While content may continue to be relevant, CEU credit only will be awarded for two years from today's date, which is April 7, 2014. There is no financial relationship between the uh, planners of this program and the speakers. There is also no commercial support for this program. I am Takenya Taylor, and today's presenter is Chris Gunther from the New Orleans Health Department. Welcome, and let's get started. Great. Thanks, Takenya. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Gunther. I'm the manager of strategic initiatives with the City of New Orleans Health Department, the local public health agency for the City of New Orleans. Um, in today's presentation, uh, I'm, I'm going to describe some of our work that we've begun over the last several years uh, to address violence from, uh, from a public health perspective. Uh, so in today's presentation, I'm going to describe why we in the City of New Orleans view violence as a public health issue and hopefully convince you of the same. Uh, and I'm going to describe why I see a primary prevention of violence as an issue of maternal and child health and a, and a priority for those who are practitioners in that field. Uh, I'm going to also describe why addressing trauma is essential for any of these uh, efforts to prevent violence uh, and describe um, some promising approaches um, that we have used in the city of New Orleans to address violence um, with the understanding that it's a complex problem that requires complex solutions. Uh, and then I'll, I'll describe a, a bit of our work um, that we've begun in New Orleans over the last several years. Uh, I want to start by giving a background of, of the New Orleans Health Department and um, the journey that our department has been on over the last several years as we've transformed ourselves into a, a modern health department. Um, our vision is that we serve the city of New Orleans as a 21st century health department and a model for the nation. Uh, and we have uh, transfor transformed ourselves from a department that historically was focused on individuals and the treatment of disease to a department that's now focused on population health uh, with an emphasis on prevention. As part of that, we have adopted um, violence as a priority for our department and see it as a major public health issue. Uh, we view it as such um, for several reasons that I'll describe later on in the presentation. Um, but in part because um, when we ask our, our residents uh, what they see as priorities, what they want to change um, about health issues in the city, they tell us that violence is, is number one among those issues. Uh, I say I give this all of this um, background, uh, one, for a bit of context um, so you know who I am, where I'm coming from, um, but also uh, as a bit of a caveat for all of my uh, presentation today to, to say that uh, we are very much still in a learning process uh, as we go about this journey. Uh, and so what I'm going to be describing today is uh, the journey that we've gone on thus far, um, but is, is one that we continue to, to learn from, and I hope to learn from uh, folks who are in the audience today as well. Uh, and lastly, I say all this um, as, a, um, uh, as an encouragement to folks who are interested in adopting this approach and the practices that we have adopted ourselves. Uh, as I mentioned, we have only been at this for about two years. Um, two years ago, we did not have a, a violence prevention program in the health department. This is the first time that our department has taken this issue on, and we've been able to ramp up our activities uh, very quickly, and I think that uh, other departments, other practitioners can do, can do likewise, uh, and I'm happy to help folks along that journey as much as we can. Um, 
So I, I'd like to um, begin with a, just a story that comes from one of my favorite television shows, Full House, uh, which is a cultural touchstone of my generation. Um, normally I, I show uh, a YouTube video from this, uh, from this episode during this, during this part of the presentation, but I'm not able to do that today, so I'll do my, the best I can to describe it. I do encourage folks to find it on YouTube after the presentation is done. Um, the clip that I'm going to describe comes from Season 7, Episode 2, titled The, Impart the Apartment. Um, and and in, in this episode, uh, DJ Tanner has begun uh, dating. She has a boyfriend named Steve. And they, uh, they're over at the Tanner household and looking to get away from the family for a little bit alone, of alone time, as, as um, youngsters are, are wont to do. And they, um, <clears throat> they escape into uh, a cement truck that is in the Tanner family driveway uh, because Uncle Joey is working on uh, repaving the driveway. And in the midst of uh, their, their little makeout session, DJ and Steve accidentally hit uh, a button on the cement truck that causes cement to come spilling into the Tanner family kitchen. Uh, and so you can imagine um, all of this cement pouring into the kitchen of this household. Uh, Uncle Joey's there, Uncle Jesse, and of course Danny Tanner are there, and they're, they're horrified by all of this cement that's coming into the kitchen, and they don't know what to do about it. And so they're trying uh, everything they can do to get the cement out of the kitchen as it's pouring in. Um, they've got a broom that they're sweeping that eventually breaks. Um, they're trying to catch it in different um, cups and, and other things that they have uh, handy in the kitchen. None of them are effective. And then finally, Uncle Jesse says, what about the truck? Why don't we go stop the truck? And so they, they run to the truck and, and hit the button and, and stop the cement from uh, pouring into the, into the kitchen. Uh, this is a little bit of a silly example and a silly story, um, but I think it's one that illustrates well the value of prevention. Um, we're compelled to respond to the immediate needs um, that are presented in our communities where uh, high violence and, and other uh, adverse health outcomes present themselves, and we must do that. Um, but I argue that in order to comprehensively address this problem, we must identify the root causes of violence and uh, get to the cement truck, so to speak, um, in, in each of our communities. And when we do that, uh, we can stop violence from, from happening before it occurs. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, the public health approach to violence. Um, and I believe um, the public health is well suited to do just this, to identify root causes, risk and protective factors um, that put individuals and communities at risk for violence, and ultimately to stop violence. So I mentioned um, we see violence as a public health issue. There's several reasons why. Uh, one, violence is extremely pervasive. Um, in 2010, 4,828 young people between the ages of 10 and 24 were victims of homicide. And nearly two out of three children have been exposed to violence. Uh, so this is um, truly an epidemic. Violence negatively affects uh, physical and mental health, not only um, for immediate victims of violence and in that, that moment uh, when someone is victimized by violence, but uh, it also has more, uh, more long-term and insidious effects. Uh, childhood exposure to violence increases risk of um, chronic disease and risky health behaviors. Uh, there's an extensive body of, of literature to support this um, through the research that um, Vince Valetti has done on ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. I encourage folks to, um, to explore that further. Uh, third, violence is a, is a significant health disparity. Um, it doesn't impact all of our communities the same way. Some of our communities are more vulnerable and at higher risk for violence. These are uh, communities typically of concentrated disadvantage and a historic concentrated disadvantage. Uh, and among ages 10 to 24, Homicide is the leading cause of death for African Americans. Uh, this is the case in New Orleans as well as it is nationally. Uh, but most importantly, uh, and why this matters, is that like a host of other health issues, violence is preventable, not inevitable. Framing the issue of violence in this way as a public health issue opens up avenues for new solutions to this problem. I'll also argue that uh, if we take a life course approach of the issue, uh, that violence is, is also a maternal child health issue and should be a, pri a priority for practitioners in that field. Uh, so the life course approach posits that early exposures matter and that early experiences contribute to later life outcomes. Um, and if we take that view of things, uh, it also opens up uh, some new avenues to solutions. So if you take that view of things, um, 
then it, it leads you to, to discover that where people live, learn, work, and play matters for violence prevention. So this opens up new avenues uh, of ways to prevent violence. Uh, maternal and child health expands the frame for potential interventions beyond just those who are at risk at this moment for violence, but also for, for mothers and their children um, who may be at risk for violence later in life uh, or maybe uh, have risk factors present in their life that put them at risk for future violence or future adverse outcomes. Uh, and maternal and child health promotes a lifelong approach to preventing violence that is, I think, um, very important to consider. The graphic that's on screen right now uh, comes from an article that I will refer to folks further that um, has been influential for, uh, for our office in addressing this issue and, and considering it as a, as a maternal and child health issue. Um, what you see is uh, the, what the authors have outlined as a telescope and lens um, approach to uh, thinking about injury prevention, uh, which is the larger field within which violence prevention uh, exists. Uh, and they describe it as a telescope and a lens, the telescope um, being uh, the life course over time. Uh, and the authors suggest that if you look backwards, um, you can identify interventions for preventing an injury in a given stage of life. And if you look forward, um, you'll see the outcomes associated with an intervention, a determinant, or an injury in a given stage of life. Um, the lens is the essentially the, the socio-ecologic uh, levels, both um, in this case at the social and physical environment. So that is a useful um, tool and a, a sort of matrix for identifying um, risk and protective factors, but then ultimately interventions uh, and programs and policies that can be effective at the level of the individual, uh, the community, and ultimately the, the society. Uh, we have also found um, that trauma is, uh, is an essential component of um, any campaign or efforts to address violence prevention. So I'd like to take a moment and um, describe a young man who has been profiled in the media uh, in New Orleans named Kennard Allen. Kennard is 11 years old. Uh, two years ago, uh, in, in May of, of 2012, he witnessed um, the shooting death of his sister, Brianna, who was five years old at the time. Uh, at her, she was killed at her birthday party um, by a, a stray bullet from a gunman who was in the neighborhood uh, and was looking to kill a particular individual um, using an AK-47 and unfortunately shot uh, Brianna, who died in her father's arms uh, on her footsteps at her, fi at her fifth birthday party. Later that year, uh, Kennard's father was stabbed to death by his stepmother after he allegedly choked and, and beat her. Uh, and then in 2013, just a year ago, um, Kennard was one of 19 people who was shot in a Mother's Day second line parade. So uh, I, I've chosen to spotlight um, Kennard because you can see just in his face the, the immense um, trauma exposure that, and exposure to violence that he has had in, in his short life. Um, and while we know about Kennard, and his case is, is remarkable and tragic. Uh, he is certainly not alone. Um, in New Orleans, 80% of murders happen in a public space. And so each of those murders is an opportunity for children to be exposed to violence. And so uh, while we know about Kennard, um, there are many more Kennards uh, out there in the city who are likely to have a, a high, similarly high exposures to trauma and are at risk for the, the adverse life outcomes that are associated with that. Um, so. We have um, found it essential to um, be trauma-informed in our approaches and to address trauma as a component of uh, any violence prevention activities and portfolio by um, preventing youth exposure to violence, mitigating the consequences of those exposures when they happen through evidence-based approaches um, to respond to trauma, and then to educate uh, our community about um, the costs of, of, of youth violence, um, not just for victims, but for those who witness it and are exposed to it in various ways. This is um, this, this kind of three-pronged model of prevent, uh, mitigate, and educate is the um, model that has been advanced by the Attorney General's Defending Childhood Initiative, um, which is a great resource for those who are interested in exploring this topic further. Uh, another sort of foundational approach and, and theory that has been very influential for us is, is um, collective impact. So this idea that um, complex problems require solutions involving multiple sectors and that these sectors need to be coordinated to all work towards the same aim. Uh, and I will argue that local health departments are well situated to adopt this approach and be an important component of it. Um, collective impact requires uh, five sort of key components uh, or tenants. Uh, one is a common agenda. 
Two is a shared measurement. Third, mutually reinforcing activities. Fourth, continuous communication. And fifth, backbone support. Um, that's the, the aspect that I'm going to elaborate the most on if folks are interested in learning more about collective impact. Um, there has been uh, an extensive body of, of literature written about it, um, even though it's a, a relatively young field. Um, and there's a link uh, at the bottom of this slide to uh, one of the articles that has been written about collective impact. Um, nevertheless, backbone support is a, a critical part of these efforts to coordinate cross-sector activities. Somebody um, needs to be doing uh, the work of um, guiding a vision and strategy, supporting aligned activities, establishing shared measurement practices, building public will, advancing policy, and mobilizing funding. Um, this, this organization uh, who provides backbone support does not necessarily need to be doing all of the work, nor should it, um, but it is critical for, uh, uh, for a or an organization to be playing this coordinating role um, for collective impact to be successful. Uh, violence is certainly a, uh, a, a problem, an issue that is ripe for the collective impact approach because it brings together uh, multiple sectors to bear on this, on this complex issue, including law enforcement, education, social services, and increasingly uh, public health. And as I mentioned, local health departments are well situated to serve as backbone organizations for violence prevention activities. That's the role that the health department plays in New Orleans. Uh, and we have found it to be um, successful for several reasons. Um, one is that public health is a, is a multidisciplinary field. Uh, we work across disciplines uh, by our nature, and it comes very naturally to those of us in public health to adopt a multidisciplinary approach. And we're very comfortable working across various sectors. Um, second, local health departments often have experience building coalitions uh, and networks to address complex issues such as um, other maternal and child health issues like low birth weight or childhood obesity are examples of other issues that the health department has taken a similar collective impact approach to addressing. Uh, and then lastly, local health departments are integrated within local governance structures, which can be very important um, for connecting uh, private and public efforts. Uh, in New Orleans, our health department is a part of city government proper. We report to the mayor. Uh, other local health departments uh, might be standalone agencies, but nonetheless, they're um, integrated within the local governance structure in some way, and that has a fair amount of value to it um, in an issue where city government has a stake, such as violence. So with a few um, sort of theoretical approaches uh, to frame the way that uh, we have chosen to address the issue of violence, I will now jump into a case study of uh, our work over the last several years. The picture that you see right now um, is the picture that is uh, immediately following a murder in New Orleans, and you'll notice um, the disturbing number of children who are present at the scene of the crime. So this is what I'm talking about when I uh, talk about an exposure to violence and how important it is to um, educate our communities about the costs of those exposures and, and prevent those exposures to violence whenever we can. The city of New Orleans murder rate has been seven to eight times the national average for over 30 years. Uh, so what this means from a public health standpoint is uh, multi-generational exposures to trauma. So we have um, several generations now that have lived in a community with extremely high rates of violence and are carrying uh, those exposures to violence uh, quite literally uh, in their bodies with them. We have uh, addressed, sought to address the issue of violence through NOLA for Life, our Mayor uh, Mitch Landrieu's comprehensive murder reduction strategy. I will give a brief overview of it, but encourage folks to check out more at nolaforlife.org. Uh, there's five pillars to this approach that involve that bridge across the spectrum of prevention, intervention, enforcement, and rehabilitation. Uh, the first pillar is to stop the shootings. This is a series of initiatives focused on uh, intervention and enforcement, uh, invest in prevention is a real priority for our mayor and for our city, and the health department has led these efforts as a part of NOLA for Life. Uh, there's also efforts to modify the built environment, uh, to get involved and rebuild neighborhoods, promoting jobs and opportunities, uh, and then finally improving the NOPD. Um, public trust in law enforcement is critical for these efforts, although, um, as our mayor says, we, we can't arrest our way out of this problem. Uh, law enforcement does have a critical role to play, and and that role should not be uh, minimized or ignored, as no matter how important the role of, of prevention is. Uh, we have seen some success to date with this approach. Um, in 2013, 
Murders were down 20% from the same period in 2012. Uh, this was um, the <clears throat> one of the lowest murder rates uh, in the city's uh, recent history. Uh, and year to date, um, we are murders are uh, are down 38 percent um, compared to where they were a year ago. So we continue to see uh, reductions in, in murder that, and we believe we're having some early success um, from the programs that have been rolled out, uh, largely focused on intervention and enforcement. Um, group violence reduction strategy is a focused deterrence uh, law enforcement effort that is aimed at focusing uh, law enforcement resources on those who are, uh, those groups and gangs who are most violent and who account for many of the murders in our city. Uh, there's a multi-agency gang unit that coordinates uh, law enforcement approaches on local, state, and federal levels um, to make sure that all the resources are, are um, aiming at the same individuals who are um, responsible for violence. And then Ceasefire Central City um, is a, an interesting um, model that adopts a, a public health approach um, similar to uh, what community health workers um, do to, to interrupt the spread of infectious disease. Um, there are trained community health workers who are called violence interrupters um, who work to engage individuals at risk for violence um, and interrupt the violence by um, convincing them to, to put the guns down and pursue other avenues. Um, and we believe that those early efforts have, have started to bear some fruit. And so that's um, forced us uh, to, to reconsider um, our prevention portfolio and really uh, to deepen our investment in prevention, which is a part of NOLA for Life, um, but was not the, the early focus. Um, so we're beginning to focus more resources on children, youth, and families uh, to, in order to sustain these reductions in violence over the long haul. Uh, we're expanding our partnerships. And we have a vision uh, that children will live in a city of peace and prosperity. To start this work, um, the health department engaged in uh, an intensive planning process that uh, was led by the health department in collaboration with a planning, a planning team that included members of law enforcement, schools, uh, the mayor's office, and, and a youth representative. This process was supported by the National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention. It's a 10-city network uh, that is led by the U.S. Department of Justice but brings together a range of federal agencies uh, to, to work on this issue. Uh, and we, in our, in our planning process, work closely with uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, and that was a, an extremely beneficial partnership for us. We also had, um, it also linked us with some partner cities uh, that have been very in influential in our process. Um, Boston and Minneapolis in particular are two, two cities that have um, really well actualized visions of a public health approach to violence. So if you're looking for cities that are a few uh, years further down this trajectory than New Orleans is, uh, certainly Boston and Minneapolis are, uh, are really model cities for the way that they've adopted the public health approach. The planning process involved um, an extensive series of listening sessions with over 150 stakeholders and ultimately uh, culminated with a youth violence prevention summit where we brought together our partners um, <clears throat> to, uh, to map out their existing youth violence prevention activities. And we put that on what's called this spectrum of prevention asset map um, that maps uh, efforts, existing efforts to prevent youth violence um, across essentially the socio-ecological uh, spectrum from the individual all the way up to the societal level and also stratifies uh, those activities by um, whether or not they're addressing uh, violence up front, which is sort of uh, primary prevention, in the thick of violence, which is uh, your sort of typical secondary prevention, and then in the aftermath, after violence has already occurred, uh, tertiary prevention. Uh, and so what we found when, um, <clears throat> when we mapped our partners' efforts uh, is that we had a fairly good um, distribution across uh, levels of prevention in terms of uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. You can see Generally, there's a fair amount of balance between the upfront and the thick and in the aftermath. Um, we uh, also have a, a strong number of coalitions and networks. This is something that uh, is relatively unique, I think, to New Orleans. Um, folks are very eager to, uh, to collaborate with one another, and so um, the spirit of, of collaboration manifests itself in a number of coalitions and networks that are already working um, on these sorts of issues. Uh, but then lastly, what we found is that uh, we're lacking um, in organizational practices and policies uh, to prevent youth violence. And so this is we see as a real promising uh, direction in, uh, to move in the future. 
um, to move beyond just the individual and relationship levels of uh, the uh, of the socio-ecological model to consider community and policy level approaches that um, that can be successful in, in, preventing, in preventing youth violence. Uh, finally, our partners reviewed and provided feedback on the draft plan, um, which was ultimately published in the fall of 2013. Uh, the plan is called the NOLA for Life Playbook, Promoting Life for All Youth, uh, and it's a strategic plan to prevent youth violence in New Orleans. The vision of the plan, or the, the sort of high-level goal of the plan, is that by 2020, 95 percent of our youth will feel safe in their schools and in their neighborhoods. Uh, we chose this this as our goal for several reasons. Firstly, it's aligned with the Healthy People 2020 benchmarks. Um, we felt that was important to align ourselves with a national benchmark for health. Uh, second, it's, it's measurable and readily accessible. So this table that you see here is um, from a survey that's given every two years in schools to 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders in Louisiana called the Caring Communities Youth Survey. And it asks students, do you feel safe in your school? And do you feel safe uh, in their neighborhood? So we have this information um, for the most recent year when the survey was given, and we have it going back uh, several years, and we'll have it going forward uh, as, a, as a benchmark to hold ourselves accountable against. Uh, but then lastly, we felt that um, youth safety uh, was an important uh, bar to hold ourselves against, um, in part because it's a way to talk about the issue of youth violence in an assets-based way. Uh, and hold ourselves accountable to something that is a, a positive metric that we all want to see for our children. And also uh, because youth safety uh, we see as the, the most distal outcome of violence. Um, so we know when uh, violence happens in a community, um, there is an immediate victim of, of that act of violence. Um, but the true cost of uh, violence comes uh, when the larger wound is inflicted on, on the community, when our children are exposed to violence we know that that has uh, serious, long-lasting health effects um, that that child is going to carry with him or her for the rest of his life. Uh, and this is a priority that we can all agree upon as a city. Uh, lastly, I'll note that um, this is quite a, a lofty goal. Um, we have quite a bit of work to do to, to achieve this goal. As you can see from this table, approximately a third of, um, of our 12th graders don't feel safe in their schools or in their neighborhood. So we have quite a bit of work ahead of us. Uh, as I mentioned, the plan is called the NOLA for Life Playbook, Promoting Life for All Youth. Um, it's designed to do three um, major things, designate a structure for youth violence prevention, coordinate and integrate activities towards shared priorities, and establish benchmarks and foster accountability for youth violence prevention. Uh, you'll note, I hope, that this, uh, these three uh, sort of buckets of work map closely onto the language of collective impact that I talked about earlier. Um, this structure is meant to, to facilitate communication and coordination. Um, these shared priorities are our city's common agenda for addressing the issue of youth violence. And um, this, these benchmarks um, that I mentioned through the CCYS survey are our first step towards, uh, towards a shared measurement and common outcomes that we can track uh, for our city. So let me talk about a bit about um, the structure that we've set up for uh, this plan to, to carry it out. As I mentioned, the health department serves as the backbone organization for this work. We have dedicated staffing to coordinate these activities. Uh, we're uh, supervising the process of data collection and tracking, and we're managing communications amongst our partners. We have tapped the Children and Youth Planning Board as the advisory body for this group. Uh, they are authorized by state law and city ordinance um, and bring together a, a diverse range of stakeholders um, including the uh, local juvenile court judge, who is the chair, uh, as well as um, other public and private stakeholders from the realms of education, criminal justice, juvenile justice, uh, law enforcement, and, uh, and, and others as well. We are also integrated uh, within the city's framework for murder reduction, NOLA for Life, and so that allows um, a measure of high-level support uh, and also some input from senior city leadership. Uh, but we're making sure that everything we do is coordinated and is in tandem with, uh, with NOLA for Life uh, and the mayor's efforts to reduce murders. Uh, our shared priorities I will um, go through very briefly and encourage folks to uh, review the full plan um, at, your, at your leisure. It's available on our website, nola.gov slash health, but is um, quite lengthy and a bit much for me to present in the time frame today. Um, so I'll just go over it on a very high level. 
Um, up front, uh, we have a goal to stop violence from happening before it occurs. This is our sort of primary prevention goal. In the thick, uh, we want to intervene at the first sign of risk and respond effectively when violence does occur. This is uh, sort of our secondary prevention approaches. And lastly, in the aftermath of violence, uh, we want to repair and restore our youth, families, and communities that have been affected by violence. This is uh, our tertiary prevention strategies. As I mentioned, um, we have set uh, uh, some benchmarks for ourselves with the Caring Communities Youth Survey. This uh, presents that data in a slightly different way, um, looking at it across time. Um, you can see that uh, youth safety has improved dramatically over the last uh, decade, but we still have quite a bit of ways to go to reach our, uh, our final goal of 95% by 2020. Um, but we do think that this is important to uh, peg ourselves to this metric to track our progress, measure um, the impact of our strategies, and ultimately ensure uh, some accountability with uh, our work to prevent youth violence. Um, so with the time remaining, I'm going to outline a few of our priorities uh, right now in 2014 as a part of the NOLA for Life playbook. Uh, first, our priority is uh, preventing school violence. We've um, done this through uh, several strategies to promote positive school climates, uh, which uh, have some evidence to reduce suspensions and expulsions, increase attendance, and improve academic performance. Uh, we've done this through two specific strategies, uh, restorative justice or restorative approaches, and positive behavior interventions and supports, PBIS. Uh, restorative justice is uh, a, an alternate discipline strategy for schools that focuses on um, reparation of harm and relationship building over punitive discipline. So, uh, for example, in a school that uses restorative approaches, two students who get into a fight uh, may be asked to participate in a community conference to repair the harm and rebuild the relationships that they were, were damaged in the fight instead of um, just a, a suspension. Uh, and Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports, or PBIS, this is a decision-making framework for schools to use um, that asks them to uh, ensure that they're tracking student data related to behavior systems so that they can calibrate uh, interventions for students at different tiers of, of interventions um, to ensure that they're promoting a positive school climate for, for all their students and meeting all their needs. Um, most relevant, perhaps, for this audience in this group is our second priority to prevent uh, family violence. We view in the City Health Department uh, WIC, the Women, Infants, and Children uh, Nutritional Program, as a nexus for family violence prevention, uh, recognizing that violence often begins early in life with exposures to violence uh, either directly uh, as a victim of child abuse or maltreatment uh, or through the witnessing of intimate partner violence in the home. Uh, and, and we also believe that this program has um, the potential for tremendous reach and impact. 62% uh, of children in New Orleans, age 5 and under, are income eligible for WIC. Um, so that's a, a remarkable reach for public health programming that we have through this program. Uh, and we believe that uh, the program is serving every day our most vulnerable children and families, and oftentimes they leave those offices with nothing more than a food voucher. Uh, we want to continue the great uh, and important nutritional work of WIC and just supplement that uh, with some additional services that we feel like are, are really critical for our families and for our communities to be safe and healthy. Um, so over the last year, we started screening for domestic violence in our WIC clinics and offering referrals to the local Family Justice Center for women who are interested in those services. Uh, and this year, we'll be expanding that work uh, to um, some parenting education in partnership with uh, the Tulane uh, University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Uh, and the children, New Orleans Children's Bureau will be offering uh, Triple P Positive Parenting Program and Play Nicely, which are two brief um, interventions that are designed to prevent child maltreatment. Um, this work is part of a CDC-funded research study um, that Tulane professor Kathy Taylor is the principal investigator on, and we're very proud to be uh, working with them. Uh, lastly, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this, uh, this slide shows uh, this sort of um, how we view WIC as a nexus for family violence, how it can be. Uh, we see it as offering um, a way into services for children, youth, and families, um, services that may otherwise be, uh, be challenging to, to link them with. 
Uh, lastly, we are um, committed to building our public health infrastructure, building our own capacity to do this work over time. Uh, we believe that how we build things and sustain them matters. So to illustrate this all, if you'll indulge me um, with a bit of uh, metaphor making with a few um, examples from around my home in New Orleans and, and on Bayou St. John. Uh, and the picture you see in the upper left is uh, the picture of the old Spanish fort on Bayou St. John which was originally built in, uh, in 1701 and ultimately served as, uh, most recently, as an old amusement park in the 1920s before it fell into disrepair and is now essentially uh, a series of, of brick ruins. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, the Magnolia Bridge uh, that also cuts across Bayou St. John, this, this um, waterway in New Orleans. It was originally um, <clears throat> built in the late 19th century and had a streetcar track that ran across it and was open to vehicles as well. Uh, it's no longer open to vehicles, um, but it now serves as a footbridge and still serves a function as a, a footpath and a, and a meeting point. Um, and so I think that these two examples um, show us that how we build things matters and how, and, and how we choose to, um, to keep up with them over time matters. Uh, and so while it is important to build these structures um, immediately and now and to begin this work, um, we are focused on, on the long view and on sustaining this work and this structure over time. And so for us, what that means uh, to build our own infrastructure in public health is um, a focus on data, uh, on staffing, and on communication. So um, we are uh, working very hard this year uh, to improve the response rate on the Caring Communities Youth Survey. The survey that I mentioned um, has historically suffered from a, uh, a low response rate in New Orleans. And so while I've presented the data that's available, uh, it's not the most dependable or reliable data um, given the low response rate that has, that has been the case in New Orleans. Um, so we've set a goal for 2014 of at least a 70% response rate and are working to uh, coordinate with schools to get the survey out this fall and collect uh, really quality data that we think is essential to hold ourselves accountable uh, for the work that we're doing. We're also staffing up, hiring additional staff members to be able to do all of this work that we've committed to. Uh, and we are finding new ways every day um, to better communicate with our partners because uh, we know how, how critical and crucial um, communication is to sustain the work of collective impact over time. So I will um, conclude with a, a few keys uh, to our early success um, to the extent that we've had it. Uh, one thing that's been extremely important is uh, committed high-level leadership. Uh, we've had this in the form of uh, Mayor Mitch Landrieu, who has been an outspoken advocate for um, this issue uh, through NOLA for Life, through his Cities United effort that brings together various mayors to discuss um, black male achievement. Um, he's also called this issue an epidemic and a public health crisis, so he understands um, very, very much the importance of prevention and has been a champion for this cause. Uh, secondly, we found it important to clearly and consistently make the case for prevention um, in forums like this, um, to policymakers, to community, make, community members, to, to funders. Um, for those of us in public health, this approach uh, to addressing violence comes naturally and, uh, and it, it, it um, is something that is very easy for us to understand, but for others it's not as self-evident. And so it's important to consistently uh, message the importance of prevention. You don't have to use uh, examples from Full House to do that, though, I will note. Um, lastly, uh, we are, uh, are we're working to, uh, to open a, a big tent um, by building partnerships locally and nationally. Uh, we have found it critical to have partnerships that run both horizontally uh, as well as vertically. By, by that I mean partnerships that uh, function locally with uh, organizations and agencies that work in New Orleans, but also um, with our counterpart health departments in cities uh, like Boston and like Minneapolis, as well as partnerships with uh, federal agencies such as the Department of Justice and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We, um, I would also encourage folks who are on this path to embrace the challenge and, and dream of solutions that are big and bold. This is uh, perhaps the greatest social issue of our time, and uh, if we are successful to address it, uh, it the solutions are not going to be uh, simple and, and easy. And lastly, we have found, um, we found it very important, as all folks in public health uh, do, 
to peg success to metrics and to, to track our progress. Um, we've done that through the Caring Communities Youth Survey that I described earlier. Uh, so I will pause um, and stop there. Uh, I want to thank the Alabama Department of Public Health for their hospitality and for hosting me today, as well as the Tulane University um, Maternal and Child Health Leadership Training Program. Um, this was a wonderful opportunity, and I look forward to, uh, to answering folks' questions. All right, Chris. We have some questions email in, and I want to remind viewers that they can either email or call in to the program to ask you questions. The first question we have is, can you talk about the initial efforts in working with New Orleans city officials and what that process were like, was like? Were they receptive and significantly important? And if so, in what ways were they? Good question. Um, yes, so we, uh, as I mentioned, are a city department. Um, the health department is a, an agency of the city and, and reports to the mayor. So it's been, um, that makes it a lot easier for us to coordinate with city folks because we're located in City Hall. Um, and I will say that the, the mayor, uh, Mitch Landrieu, has been, um, he has been very committed to this issue since he came into office. He outlined this uh, reducing murder in New Orleans as his number one priority um, and has said publicly that if he does anything in his time as mayor of New Orleans, he, uh, he will reduce the, the number of murders in the city and make it a safer place. Um, so he came in already with that um, vision in mind, but um, as a, a really forward-thinking leader, he um, drew in, uh, he tapped three uh, city leaders to uh, develop NOLA for Life, this framework for murder reduction that I outlined briefly and that this work is, is a part of. Um, he tapped the police chief, the criminal justice commissioner, uh, and my, my boss, the, the health commissioner. Um, to be the three leaders that would be the architect, the kind of high-level architects of this plan and ultimately accountable for, for its success. Um, so that's something that, um, that our mayor uh, has really emphasized from, from day one, that this is a public health issue and that more, um, more sectors than law enforcement must be involved in this to be effective. Um, so we've been fortunate to have that high-level success from day one, but uh, I would encourage anyone who is um, is considering this approach or is eager to adopt this approach in, in your own community to um, get that that support as quickly as you can because it's it's critical for the success of these efforts okay the next comment and question we have is a great program and the new orleans health department needs to be commended for this effort in getting this effort up and running was there any categorical funding for staff time and resources is the first uh, part of this question and the second part is what suggestions may you have in order to get started in, this, in today's tight economic environment? <laughs> yeah. Um, we, uh, so uh, initially um, our violence prevention program lead was a commitment um, that the mayor and uh, the health commissioner and the city council made uh, in the city's general fund to fund a position in the health department to uh, head up this work and be sort of the, the coordinator for it. Um, we've ultimately been uh, successful in leveraging uh, additional grant funds from that one uh, general funded position and now have um, several additional positions that are being hired um, from grant funds through the National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention and the Department of Justice. Um, we do still think it's critical to have uh, someone who is, uh, who is general funded, uh, a committed sort of line item in the budget to um, this program understanding that grant funds um, can come and, and go. Uh, we think it's really important to have this position as a part of our organizational structure um, no matter what. And so at the very least, we'll have at least uh, one person in our office working on this issue. But ideally, uh, with additional grant funds, we'll always have, have more than that. Um, so I would encourage folks to seek out grant funding. But if you can, carve out a spot in this in your agency's budget. It's, uh, just, it's been really important for us to have that. The next question is, is there a Crime Stoppers effort in New Orleans? And if yes, how were they involved in this? Yeah, Crime Stoppers has been uh, very successful in New Orleans. Um, in fact, the police chief has spoken publicly about how uh, he thinks that that has played a role in some of these early reductions um, in, in murders. Um, increasingly, pol the police are reporting um, good intelligence that's coming through uh, Crime Stoppers that's allowing them to um, make arrests on cases that is really important um, for people to be held ac accountable when, uh, when an act of violence occurs. We hope in the health department that we're hoping to reduce the occurrences, period, but in the event that they occur, law enforcement certainly has a role to play, and Crime Stoppers, by all accounts, has been helpful in that. Um, they were 
a part of our planning process, they have um, a, uh, a group, um, Crime Stoppers in New Orleans is a group of young people that they engage with uh, periodically, and so we worked uh, to include Crime Stoppers as one of our partners that were convened for the summit um, and for some of these other listening sessions. Uh, they were involved and have been a, a wonderful partner. The next question is, could you please say a bit more about the framing of violence prevention as a maternal child health, health issue? In particular, she's asking, is there any work beyond the WIC nexus, such as home visiting take place, taking place, or, and where can you learn more about your WIC parenting education initiatives? Sure. Um, I'm happy to talk more with folks uh, about the, the stuff that we're doing in our WIC clinics. Um, my contact information is is up on the screen now. I welcome folks to um, contact me directly if they have questions. Um, and I can also connect you to the folks, uh, our, our research partners at Tulane, who are doing fantastic work um, to be able to, we hope, measure some outcomes from this. Uh, and if that's the case, some, it's something that we want to scale immensely. Um, but the other question about this maternal child health um, and, and violence prevention uh, connection that we see is uh, really based on, on the life course theory and this idea that if you go further back in the life course, um, you find additional opportunities to prevent adverse health outcomes. Uh, and, and we certainly see that is the same way uh, with violence. Violence often begins um, early in life with uh, an exposure to violence that um, is, as I mentioned, uh, associated with a series of, of adverse life outcomes. Um, and so uh, both of those um, uh, approaches, the public health approach to violence and, and the life course theory uh, as a part of maternal and child health really have kind of pointed us towards uh, early childhood um, and even the time um, when the mother is pregnant as an opportunity to intervene um, and prevent violence and stop it from happening before it occurs. So in addition to the work that's going on in our WIC clinics, um, we are uh, increasingly uh, working to um, align our efforts internally to achieve sort of collective impact uh, within our health department's programs as much as we can. Um, we've taken a look at um, how we can deploy our home visiting uh, resources. We have a Healthy Start program um, that is, a, as I'm sure many of the audience will be aware, is a home visiting program. Um, and uh, so we've taken some steps to, to figure out how we can deploy those resources strategically in neighborhoods with high rates of violence. Um, what we have found is that neighborhoods with high rates of violence are the same um, neighborhoods with high rates of low birth weight, with high rates of childhood lead exposure, with um, high rates of premature death from chronic diseases. These are neighborhoods of uh, chronic disadvantage and, uh, and, and in many cases, serious um, divestment of public and private resources over a period of generations. Um, and so violence is, in many cases, just sort of an additional indicator of, um, of that divestment and that disadvantage um, that has existed in, the, in those communities for a long period of time. Um, lastly, I will, uh, so I will note that um, on, the, on the question of home visiting um, programs, the Nurse Family Partnership, uh, which in, in our uh, locality is, is a state-run program, is a fantastic uh, program and has lots of great evidence behind it uh, as, a, um, as a way to prevent violence um, and improve life outcomes um, in, a, in a number of different ways. Um, so I would encourage folks um, to take a look at the Nurse Family Partnership model. Um, and if you're already uh, implementing it in your community, take a look at how it's being implemented, where it's being implemented, um, and deploy it strategically uh, in areas that have high rates of violence. So Chris, what's the most important first step a community can take to adopt this, this approach, uh, public health approach to addressing uh, violence in their community? Yeah, um, so the most important thing is to have a plan. Um, that was the first thing that, that we sought to do. Um, we know that uh, communities that have been effective in um, preventing youth violence are those that have uh, implemented a coordinated response to the issue. So um, in cities like Minneapolis, uh, where they developed a strategic plan to prevent youth violence, they saw um, serious uh, decreases in uh, youth, rates of youth, youth homicide in subsequent years, um, owing in large part to this coordinated approach, a plan that they wrote 
um, and developed to bring together all these various sectors that have uh, to bear on this issue of, of youth violence. And so I would encourage folks um, to first take stock of what you have existing in your community uh, and make a plan to coordinate those resources and, if necessary, develop new um, programs, policies, interventions to prevent youth violence. Um, a couple of resources that can help get folks started with that, uh, CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, has some really nice resources uh, on, in their section on, on youth violence prevention to get folks started in thinking about this issue. Uh, and also a group that we work closely with through our planning process, the Prevention Institute, uh, are real uh, experts in this field and uh, provided some really fantastic uh, training and technical assistance to us as we were going through um, our process. Uh, and then again, the cities that I mentioned that are um, really kind of shining examples of how this public health approach can be realized in cities are Boston and Minneapolis. So I would look to them, um, and they have both of them have really well written um, plans that we, uh, frankly, borrowed from heavily um, because they're they're so well well written and uh, and coherently state the case for violence as a public health issue. And how do you maintain the support for prevention over time? Yeah, so that's a that's a challenge. Um, and uh, that is why uh, I've, meant, I, I've said that it's, it's critical to message the, um, the value of prevention clearly and consistently again and again, um, because prevention is the first thing uh, that gets uh, lost when um, tragic acts of violence happen. Um, we are compelled to respond to those acts of violence and to meet the immediate needs of, uh, of folks. And that the, in doing so, um, that, that has benefit in preventing future violence. But um, we also have to keep our, our eyes on the, on the long view uh, and remember the value and the importance of, of prevention. Um, so we have found it critical to um, build these sorts of partnerships, uh, again, both locally and nationally. Um, that's helped us get funding to uh, expand this work and, and do more things. Um, and, but also locally it helps us um, sustain the work because we know that if there are, are others um, who are active in this area, they can um, leverage their activities against ours and ultimately um, you know, carry this work on if for some reason the health department is, is no longer able to do so. All right. We have a viewer who wants to know, has there been any efforts to work with groups like Big Brother Big Sisters? Yes, um, there has. Unfortunately, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters ha funding has, has um, been cut in New Orleans and so they're no longer in our region. Uh, which is really unfortunate. But for folks uh, who are watching elsewhere, uh, I would encourage them to look to groups like that. Um, a, a, a positive connection to a caring adult is one of the most important things uh, in, a children, in a child's life and is a key protective factor against violence. Um, so we have, in the, even in the absence of um, groups like Big Brothers Big Sisters, there are other groups who uh, do mentoring in New Orleans. Uh, and so our approach uh, as the city has not been to make a new program because we don't think that that's necessary. Um, what we've done is instead provide those groups for mentoring with um, a space for conversations about a shared set of standards and measures for uh, mentoring programs in New Orleans. Uh, and then also some training about how to specifically work with, uh, with people who um, are at highest risk for violence. So what we found is that many mentoring programs just mentor anybody who needs a mentor, which is, is wonderful, but we know that some kids need mentors more than others and that um, we can calibrate the mentorship to be really effective for those who are at highest risk for violence and that's ultimately going to produce um, the best outcomes that we want to see. So we have focused on sort of uh, convening these partners and training and technical assistance versus uh, establishing a new mentorship program. Uh, which is an approach that I, I would encourage folks to, to, to consider. But certainly, um, if you have Big Brothers Big Sisters in your, in your community, um, reach out to them because they're a really important partner for this type of work. All right. I think we have a caller um, from New York who wants to ask a question. Yes. Um, my name is Sunday. I'm calling from New York. Uh, my question is about intimate uh, partner violence. And I know this is a very um, threatening issue as the family and children. So I just want to know how does the, uh, your city, or in what way does your city address this issue? And what are the programs that are available you know, to deal with this, with the people? Got it, yeah, so the question's about intimate partner violence. Um, we have uh, revamped our health department's uh, approach to this issue 
uh, and the way that we have um, viewed it historically. Um, in New Orleans, the city's domestic violence program was a part of the Office of Criminal Justice Coordination. Um, over the last year, we have brought that program under the health department, um, which is important uh, sort of for, for high-level framing and that sort of thing, but also uh, makes it much easier for me to collaborate with the, the domestic violence program director um, and has been really critical for, uh, for the health department to get our foot into this arena. Um, our domestic violence program uh, is active in a couple of ways. The, the biggest one is uh, with the Blueprint for Safety, uh, which is a, um, a model approach to coordinating policies across the criminal justice system related to domestic violence or intimate partner violence. Um, and so uh, the, the, um, the folks uh, on our team who work in that area are um, essentially mapping out each criminal justice agency's response to um, domestic violence uh, and are working on a common set of policies to improve um, folks' experience with the criminal justice system when uh, it's involved in, in domestic violence. So this has involved um, everyone from the, the um, 911 call center to uh, the police department to the district attorney to the defenders to the sheriff's office um, and everyone in between. Uh, a key partner in this effort has been the New Orleans Family Justice Center. Uh, which is part of this uh, nationwide network of, of family justice centers, um, and they are essentially a, a one-stop shop for all domestic violence or intimate partner violence-related services in New Orleans uh, and have been just a fantastic partner. They were involved in this planning process that I described um, and have been closely involved in all of our work as a health department to address intimate partner violence in our maternal and child health programs. Um, they've been a, a source of training. A, uh, a referral source and are just, just critical. So our approach has um, involved a number of different things, um, but has involved extensive partnerships with folks in criminal justice, as well as a look sort of internally about um, what we can do as a department uh, within our own programs about the issue of, of intimate partner violence. All right, we have an email question and comment. Um, this viewer says, thank you for your presentation. In taking the life course approach and mentioning Mayor Landrews, we can't arrest our way out of this issue. What are you doing to address the stigma that the adolescent population may have towards law enforcement? Yeah, great question. Um, so that is a, a whole um, pillar of work under NOLA for Life is improving the New Orleans Police Department. Um, our police department is under uh, a consent decree right now um, from the Department of Justice, essentially an agreement um, with DOJ to, uh, between the city and, and the Department of Justice about a, a shared um, or a, a series of steps that the police department is going to go through over the next several years to um, reform itself. We know that uh, the city um, police department has historically not been um, trusted and, and with good reason given some of the things that have happened, uh, unfortunately, in our city between uh, members of the police and citizens. Um, and so there's a whole initiative that's aimed at um, procedural justice, uh, which is essentially this idea that um, every interaction that uh, citizens have with the police is an opportunity um, to improve the police's um, perception among the community. And so it involves um, some training about so-called selling the stop. So if a police officer stops someone um, on the street, they're expected to explain everything that they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, and so even if um, the individual might not agree with being stopped or um, the, the law enforcement consequences that, uh, that ha happen, happen as a result of that, they can at least understand what's happening and um, understand that there's a measure of fairness in it uh, and, and so that the police are, um, are really in many ways focused on customer service. Our police chief has said that that's um, his department's number one goal is, is customer service um, because that is really critical. If folks don't trust uh, the law enforcement in, in the community, uh, it's, it's a real challenge. And, um, and so I don't want to uh, create the perception through my presentation that uh, law enforcement doesn't have a role to play in this because they certainly do. It, it's, it's critical. Um, and so I would in, you know, encourage folks to involve your police department as much as you can in these sorts of efforts. Um, they've been a wonderful partner of ours and have begun to see um, some, er some survey results are suggesting that folks' perception of, of NOPD is, is changing and improving. Uh, and we think that that is probably a contributor to the success um, to the extent that we've had it with NOLA for Life to this point. So Chris, what are some challenges a community might encounter if they decide to adopt this approach? Yeah, so uh, challenges are um, 
The, the key one is really this, um, this question of, of prevention and how to message it to folks who aren't in public health. Again, this is, um, we just think this is so important. Um, framing the issue in the, in the, using the language of public health as a public health issue is, uh, we think, important in and of itself as a way to talk about this issue. Um, and so it's critical to educate folks in your community to be able to have these kinds of conversations with folks at different levels, uh, the high kind of grass tops folks as well as the grassroots folks. Um, what we found is that grassroots folks, the, our neighborhood residents, understand very well this language of prevention uh, and it's very intuitive for them and so they can be great allies. Um, but uh, it is hard for policymakers to sometimes keep their eye on prevention um, because again, when something terrible happens, when folks are shot, um, people want to see action and people want to see consequences as a result of that. And uh, it, it can be really challenging and difficult to um, keep the eye on the ball of prevention and sustain the momentum of these programs uh, when they have a, you know, a long time horizon. All right. We don't have any further questions right now, but if you want to give us a few closing comments before we end the program. Sure. Um, I would just say uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to share. Uh, we have benefited immensely from opportunities like this to share our experiences, to hear questions from other folks, uh, ask us to examine the work that we're doing um, and think about uh, if what we're doing really makes sense. Um, and we learn so much from this, this dialogue. Uh, and so my, you know, I've shared my contact information. Um, please do, do reach out. Um, and, and my, I mean, really the message of this presentation is that uh, violence is preventable and not in inevitable, um, and that when we talk about it with the language of public health, um, that really matters. So I would encourage folks to, to take that message to heart um, and to the extent that you can, adopt that approach in your community. Of course, when I say that, then we have another question. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, this is uh, about PR and marketing. Uh -huh. um, has the effort included a marketing campaign that includes billboards, TV, radio, public service announcements, and churches? And if so, can you talk about this and how we can get help um, getting people to talk about violence and activities to curb this epidemic? Yeah. Um, wow, it's almost like somebody, man, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, yes, we have. Uh, as a part of NOLA for Life, there's a public awareness campaign called uh, Flip the Script. Um, if you go to nolaforlife.org, you can see examples of um, print uh, things that have been produced as part of Flip the Script, um, as well as media or uh, radio and, and TV um, bits that have been produced as part of, of the Flip the Script campaign. Uh, we have been really fortunate that our mayor is really charismatic and is great at making friends with folks, and so he um, reached out to Spike Lee, uh, who contributed his marketing firm's uh, resources in kind. Uh, it was, uh, I think, almost about a million dollars of in-kind resources to dedicate his marketing firm to producing this campaign. So it looks really great. Um, it's fantastic. That's not the kind of thing that everybody can necessarily do. Um, and I don't know that I would encourage folks to, to give Spike a call. Um, but uh, but it, it has, it, you know, it's, it's resulted in a really nice public awareness campaign. And the, the point of Flip the Script really um, is... Uh, that we want to flip the script on the narrative of young black men in New Orleans. Um, uh, the mayor sees this as a, as a really personal issue for him um, and wrestles with it in a, in, a, in a deeply personal way that is inspiring um, as somebody who works for him to see. He, um, and so he feels very strongly that um, part of the issue of, of violence is that this, this issue has been accepted for a very long time. Our murder rate has been extremely high for a very long time, and many of the victims of these murders were, were young black men, and that was something that was accepted. And so um, Flip the Script is about uh, changing that narrative uh, and recognizing the fact that these young men have great value to our community. And when we lose them, we're losing uh, a piece of our community and something of great value, and ultimately we're all harmed as uh, citizens of the city when we lose these, these young men, primarily. Uh, and so I would encourage folks to, to check that out. Um, there has also been some, the mayor's office has also done some work to engage um, faith leaders. That is, um, I appreciate the question because they are a critical partner in this work um, and uh, can be a, a, an extremely powerful voice um, as advocates for this cause uh, and partners in, in prevention. So um, definitely encourage folks to check out the, the Flip the Script campaign on nolaforlife.org, but then also um, think about ways that you might engage uh, your faith leaders in your community. Um, the Department of Justice 
has uh, a, a really nice um, kind of toolkit about how to en how to start engaging faith leaders. Um, so encourage folks to to check that out as a, a potential resource um, to begin doing that work and engage in um, the the necessary voices to be your advocates. All right, I want to give viewers time to give us any last minute emails or calls. But um, are there any other topics you want to discuss that we maybe haven't covered during the program today? Um, no, I mean I I think I've we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I hope that um, folks enjoyed the presentation. It's, as I said, it's been a pleasure, and I thank the folks who, who helped put this on. Right. Well, the Alabama Training Network would like to thank you for coming and putting this presentation on. Thanks. And uh, we are just so excited about everyone who viewed the program today and um, you being here, and we hope that everyone has learned a great deal of, about this approach. So thank you, and thank you, viewers. Thanks.